So, so um, for those of you that uh, were present at my last presentation, I referenced a story, a published story, and um, and to the extent that I was asked to come back and follow up on some of the things that we talked about in that session, I thought I would build uh, upon that discussion and uh, maybe begin with a story. So uh, my intent uh, today, and I'll I'll just share with you. Um, I'll start with a story, uh, and I'm going to uh, make comments about reactions that that story stimulated, uh, uh, some of uh, that I, I mentioned at uh, last presentation. But then I want to use that as a jumping off point to talk about story work. I, I, uh, the, the nice thing about doing uh, presentations like this uh, is that you can sort of make up words. So I made up a word called story work, um, uh, and, and I want to really talk about storytelling and healthcare, uh, and focus a little bit calling on the work of Arthur Frank about what is the patient's story and, and how do we see the patient's story, and then move into story work as a therapeutic practice. How might story work help not just the patient, but the provider uh, uh, to uh, as a way of making an argument about healing the healer? So that's that's where I'm uh, going to go in the in the brief time that we'll be chatting together today. Uh, I'm happy to make this conversational, so feel free to unmute and just interrupt me or chime in at any point if you have some comments, questions, or pushback. Um, and then we'll certainly have plenty of time for discussion at the end of the uh, presentation. So uh, I'll start with the story, which I called legal advice. And I'm just going to uh, share this story. It's a brief story and then uh, talk a little bit about reactions. This is called legal advice. I knew after the first few sentences of our conversation that I would need to schedule her follow-up appointments for longer time slots than the usual 15 minutes. I knew that she would put me behind schedule in this first appointment. She was going to disrupt the efficiency of my office on this day and probably for a long time to come. Her problem wasn't simple. She had a primary kidney disease that led to the nephrotic syndrome, a condition that results from the spillage of large amounts of protein molecules from the blood as it traverses the kidneys filtering units. I was, to be exact, her third specialist. She knew just enough to write down more questions on her yellow legal pad and to consume more time than we had allotted to pose these questions one at a time with deliberation and precision that would have made her lawyer son proud. Her son surfaced from 1,200 miles away quite early in our patient-physician relationship. He was on a mission to assess my competence and assure my cooperation. No further tests were to be ordered on his mother, he commanded, and no further medications prescribed without my checking with him first. Still fairly early in my relationship with this woman, I now found both of them annoying. At the end of the day in the office, I phoned him to discuss his letter, acknowledging how difficult it must be as her only son helping his mother through this ordeal from such a long distance. I explained that because his mother was of sound mind and because she had clearly instructed me that I could update her son from time to time, but that her care would be between her and me, he had no right, legally or otherwise, to intrude on her care in this way. His mother made it clear to him that I was the kidney specialist with whom she was going to follow up. He was stuck with me, competent or not. She was an extreme case of the sort of patient often referred to by tired doctors as high maintenance, a phrase that always seemed to understate her approach a bit. Over the course of her illness, I slowly came to appreciate her quirkiness and odd manner. Her persona gradually drew me in. Eventually, I discovered who she was. She had played the harp in a major metropolitan orchestra. I was beginning to appreciate her music, connecting with her, caring for her, and caring about her. And she made me understand how important it was to her that she could trust me, that I would stick with her, be present for her, help her. We became very close. Every failure of treatment exasperated me as well as broke my heart. We did the best we could. But as she and I continued to forge a meaningful patient-physician relationship, I continued to struggle to reassure her distant son and came to simply tolerate what I knew was a measurable doubt 
and mistrust on his part. Almost exactly two years from the day we met, she awoke feeling pressed to the bed, as she put it, as though someone was holding her chest firmly to the bed, not allowing her to sit up, not allowing her to breathe. When the paramedics arrived, she was delirious and cyanotic. She was dying. After several hours in the emergency department, she was stabilized and transferred to the intensive care unit Radiographs revealed the source of her breathing troubles. On both sides of her chest, large amounts of fluid accumulating as a result of her kidney condition were collapsing her lungs. It was on the third hospital day that I got the call from her intensive care unit nurse. She sounded upset. She told me that my patient was in the midst of a code blue resuscitation. When I arrived at her bedside only a few minutes after the call from the nurse, the chaos was at fever pitch. As I maneuvered to her bedside, I saw her eyes. She was now awake, bucking at the tube in her throat, flailing like a captured animal. I took her hand in mine, and we seemed to make eye contact. I tried to speak above the din, to reassure her, to explain what was happening. I stayed with her for what turned into a four-hour fit of resuscitation. At some point during these events, as the imminence of her death began to settle into my consciousness, it came to me that I should step away from the bedside and phone her son. He needed to know that we were losing her. I would have to tell him she was bleeding because of a large hole we made in a large artery because we decided to put a large tube in her chest to expand her lung that had collapsed because of the needle we used to remove the fluid from her chest. I had asked the lung doctor to help her. I had initiated this death spiral. Should I tell her son that it was my fault? He had had little trust in me all along. Had I validated his doubt? Was he right about me? During the phone conversation, he sounded calm and objective. As I detailed the chronology of events that had brought us to this point, her dying became more palpable to me. The further I delved into the story of her bloodletting, the harder it became to speak. At some point, I realized that I could no longer mask my own emotions as the events unfolding in front of me. I was crying. We lost come as soon as he could arrange his travel. By the next morning, she had escaped certain death. Meeting her son that day was less awkward than I had anticipated. Here was her crying, incompetent doctor to tell her to tell how she had somehow lived despite my involvement in her care and resuscitation. That she had survived was all that gave me comfort in meeting him that morning. Over the ensuing eight days, her hospital course was rocky. Every day I visited her, her son was at her bedside. He was consistently cordial, genuinely appreciative, and somehow softer than I expected he would be. By the phone com but the phone conversation hung over me during every meeting with him, pointing at me, chiding me, reminding me of how I must have appeared to him when his mother's life had hung in the balance. Eight days after the chest tube crisis, her lungs began to fail. She developed pneumonia. Her oxygen levels were again deteriorating. But we had all agreed, because we knew what she would want, to venture no further into life-sustaining treatments. Her son was holding her hand when she died. I was outside the room, pacing like an expected, expectant parent until she breathed her last. In the small conference room, her son, the nurse, and I went over the final details of paperwork and arrangements. I answered his last few questions, wishing they'd been written on a yellow legal pad and signed the final documents. It was over. As I stepped just outside the little room where he now sat alone with the paper remnants of his mother, I fought back tears. Not wanting to live with what had happened for the rest of my career, I stepped back tentatively into the room with one foot, staying partly in the hallway where I could breathe. There's one more thing I feel compelled to speak with you about. That day, I thought I was losing her. When I called you in Dallas, I felt like I didn't do a very good job assuring you that she was in good hands. 
you must have been able to tell that I lost control of my emotions during that conversation. Everything was happening so fast, and it was just beginning to occur to me that I was losing her. Anyway, I was very fond of your mother, and I'm sorry I lost it on the phone in the middle of all of that. His response was shocking to me. He stood up and extended his hand to me. We shook hands. And then he said that for the entire two years I was his mother's doctor, he had worried about whether I really knew what I was doing. But I want you to know, he continued, that it wasn't until that day when I heard your voice cracking and I sensed your emotional response to my mother's dying that I knew you were the one, the only doctor I wanted to have looking after my mother. And I'll always be thankful that you are that doctor. So I commented <clears throat> at the last session that after that story was published, it was something that I'd had on my bucket list to do. It was to publish this creative story in a major medical journal. And I also mentioned that just about every medical journal has created space for these kinds of uh, writings now, specialty or subspecialty journal. Uh, in the Annals of Internal Medicine, the column is called On Being a Doctor. Uh, I received, uh, as I had said back then, a number of emails, 25 or 30 emails from doctors all over the country. And uh, once I had uh, kind of put them all together and looked at them all together, I saw some recurrent themes in the responses that came in the emails. And this is what they look like. Every single one of them had some version of gratitude. Every single one of those physicians had emailed me to say thank you for the story. And then the second most recurrent theme was something to the extent of these are the stories we should be telling each other, or these are the conversations we should be having with each other. And then the one I enjoyed most was the number of doctors who said, when I get my annals of internal medicine, the on being a doctor column is the first thing I read. And some of them said, it's the only thing I read. So I want to, I want to use that story, uh, sort of to kind of focus our conversation about why aren't we telling these stories to each other? Why aren't we having these conversations? And clearly the fact that these columns appear in journals means that we're, we're, we're moving in that direction, right? We are beginning to do that. Um, but um, one of the things that jumped has jumped out at me in, uh, in kind of thinking about this approach about having these conversations or or telling these stories is uh, is some of the work of Arthur Frank, who I also mentioned previously, a medical sociologist who has had his own uh, experiences with critical illness and cancer, as a matter of fact, who uh, has made the observation that as he has tried to find ways to tell his illness stories, a number of distinctions about story have emerged that he eventually comes to describe as tensions around the question, uh, what is the story exactly? And I think these tensions are instructive for our conversation today. And so I just wanna go through those very briefly. The first tension that Frank describes is between illness uh, and disease, right? That the extent to which those are different, that the disease is really a condition of the body uh, as opposed to the illness as an experience, that the disease can be reduced to biochemistry, right? It's something very scientific and techn technologic, uh, whereas an illness involves a biography that includes a reflective consciousness, it pulls in relationships, it involves institutions, power structures, etc. For the sick person, as soon as the disease is imagined, it's already become an illness, right? And it's personalized, it's very particular, it's this person's, right? But for any particular person, these versions of the story, the disease and the illness, are conjoined, right? And uh, I go back to Broyard, the literary critic who's written about his own illness experiences, who says to the typical physician, my illness is a routine in his rounds, while for me, it's the crisis of my life. The physician's operating on the left side of this uh, slide, right? And the patient's on the right. And he goes on to say he would feel better if he had a doctor that at least perceived this incongruity. And do we, I mean, do we perceive this incongruity? The second tension uh, is between being a patient and being an ill person, right? The person who is ill 
is a patient only some of the time. And yet we as healthcare providers impose the term patient as a total identity. In fact, we come to see this person as a patient, right? As opposed to as an ill person. And that definition, the patient comes with an expected role, right? There's a script that the patient is to follow. But the ill person remains many other things as well, which we often tend to lose track of. And so Arthur Frank comes to describe the patient as a distracted ill person. And what he means by that is that it's a person that's distracted from all the other things going on in her life or his life by having to focus on the disease and this relationship. And, and as a result, ill people are led to forget that their lives are being more than just being sick, right? And Frank thinks that's a problem. The third tension is that the medical history is not the person's story, right? So, and Frank makes the accusation that healthcare providers are seduced into the illusion that they come to know a person, know an ill person by knowing that person's medical history. Whereas the person's story includes a lot of other stuff that the storyteller wants known, right? This medical history, which by the way, is a very important, has great utility, a very important tool that, that we all learn, has set parameters for, so the interview work interviewer works on uh, an already set set of parameters for relevance. So we know what we're looking for. We're focused in on specific symptoms, specific parts of the history, rather than uh, getting to what is unique about the person. So that really delimits the ill person into this patient identity, as opposed to demonstrating the multidimensional, multi, uh, uh, this sort of uh, intersectionality of identities that a patient presents. Now, the history obviously is very useful, right? Because it leads us to an appreciation of the disorder or the disease. But what gets lost is an appreciation of the person that has the disorder. And then the final tension that Frank talks about is between the provision of treatment and the offering of care. That treatment is provided as a service, but the care is offered as a gift, which uh, is a very, I think, interesting thing to think about. That treatment is very instrumental. It's the treatment leads to an end. So you have the disease, we treat it, and then we have an outcome. Whereas giving and receiving care is seen as an end in itself. The treatment requires technical expertise. So it's very one-dimensional. Um, whereas care involves not just what we know and what we can do, but our emotions, right? And it's personalized and particular. Again, the treatment is very bounded. I'm the treater, you're the, you're the treated, as opposed to being in a relationship where we're both subjects. There's no subject and object. And he also makes an important case that I think we should think about, that uh, treatment is untroubled by its use of power as a resource, whereas in relationships, uh, I think care is more sensitive, endlessly sensitive to the power asymmetries in the relationship. So I think that's an interesting set of tensions to think about. And uh, so as I line them up here, I guess I'd open it up uh, to, briefly for your responses. I guess my sense is that healthcare providers are by many forces driven sort of to the left of this slide, right? So what drives us there? What do you think? Let me hear any comments or, or observations from all of you. What do you think drives us? Or do you even agree that we're driven in that direction? I totally agree we're driven in that direction. And I think we're driven by lack of time. Um, we're driven by... Um, uh, monetary reimbursement that, you know, you have to see so many patients in, in a day. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're driven by um, exactly that construct. You've got a patient, they've got an illness, you take the history, you treat them. Um, so those are the thoughts just on the top of my head where we're completely driven to the left there. Yeah, and I agree with all those forces, the the productivity demands, payment, time that is allotted, et cetera. Other thoughts? Yeah, 
if you really get to know the person, then you become more vulnerable yourself and may have to deal with feelings you don't want to deal with. Yeah, that's a great observation. So in some ways, it's a self-defense mechanism. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, yeah I like that idea. Any other thoughts? Um, I think I want, like, I want to add about the legal aspect. You know, we're so worried about, you know, litigation so that <clears throat> I think sometimes we forget to show that we are actually human for fear mm -hmm. of, of that, you know, being uh, a sign of weakness in our patients or their loved ones. Yeah, and I and I would add to that. I I completely agree, and I would add to that that I don't think it's just the fear of litigation as much as the fact that we are taught both explicitly and implicitly uh, that we need to be strong and uh, to some extent stoic and um, and stand up to these uh, scenarios, right? And demonstrate. In fact, it's often confused in the professionalism conversation. You have to be professional, as though. Uh, the expectation is that professional means unemotional in these moments. And I mean, I clearly, when I was seeing this patient and going through this experience, I clearly believed that I wasn't supposed to cry. I was mortified that I could, I did that. I was absolutely mortified. And I knew that it was going to be translated into, I don't trust you. You're too soft. So, so let me just uh, then wrap up and then we can have a broader conversation because I want to, I want to talk a little bit about what all of this has led me to think about uh, that I've come to now call uh, story work, right? So I'm going to start with one element of story work uh, that is, that I'll call storytelling. So, because uh, I think that healthcare providers are vendors of the story in some ways. I mean, we, we uh, deal with stories, we are we tell stories, we receive stories, and Rita Sharon uh, puts the word honor stories with receiving. So receiving and honoring uh, our patient stories, and we share stories. So I've kind of identified what happens when we do these things, when we tell stories, what happens when we receive stories, and what happens when we um, share stories. Uh, and all of this is meant to make an argument uh, on the side of how this is therapeutic, not just to the patient, but to us. And I'm using some uh, other people's language here. Rita Sharon, who's the person who put the name on the whole narrative medicine movement, talks about narrative knowledge, which is in some ways storytelling, how storytelling attempts to illuminate the universally true by revealing the particular, right? So it, storytelling is a way of telling truths. Um, and even, even when we ex experience fiction, we can learn great truths from that. And then I go back to Broyard because I think he writes so eloquently about us as health caregivers that I think we can learn from Broyard, who writes that my initial experience of illness was to try to bring it under control by turning it into a narrative. We describe what is happening as if to confine the catastrophe. And while that can be true for him as a patient, I, I, I guess what I think we've lost track of is it can be true for us as well, as we create these narratives, as we uh, operate in these narratives, that uh, it can help us confine the catastrophe and bring it under control, right? Um, I, I, I've often reminisced about a woman who came to see me with chronic kidney disease a number of years ago. Um, showed up in my office, elegantly dressed, uh, kind of an older uh, woman. And uh, I had a 45 minute appointment to discern what was causing her kidney disease. And early in the discussion, I saw on the history sheet that she had filled out in advance of the visit that she had lost her husband and that she had lost a daughter. And when I got to that po point in the history and asked about it, she began to cry and talked about the fact that she'd lost her husband and then a few months later lost her daughter. And she then went off a tangent and started talking about how after her daughter, after she lost her daughter, her lady friend took her out shopping and she went into this store where they had all this elegant yarn and she bought a bunch of yarn and she knew her husband would have been mad that she spent so much money on this yarn and she started knitting scarves and she 
began making scarves. And then the, uh, the friend said, these scarves are beautiful. You should sell those. She started taking her to these craft shows. She was selling scarves. And as she was telling me this story, my the pressure was building up inside of me as I was watching the time, the 45 minute visit tick by and tick by and tick by as she went on and on about how she had been knitting scarves and she was selling scarves. And um, and about five minutes at the, toward the end of the visit, I had like five minutes left to figure out what was going on with their kidneys. It dawned on me that this was the story that needed to be told, right? For some reason, this was the story that needed to be told. I said to her, would you be okay? I said, I really appreciate you sharing this story. I, I really thank you for sharing it. Would you be okay if we set another appointment and had you come back and then we could talk about your kidney disease? And she was delighted. She was said, oh, that would be wonderful. In fact, it's interesting. She said, I'll do it under one condition. I said, what's that? She said, if you will allow me to bring one of these scarves to present to you as a gift to your wife. And when I reflected upon that, it, it, it hadn't occurred to me while I was listening to the story, but metaphor is a very powerful thing in the lives of our patients and in the stories that they tell. And isn't, isn't it a fascinating metaphor uh, for taking yarn, a bunch of different colored yarns, and putting the, those yarns together into something beautiful like a scarf to create order out of chaos, uh, which is exactly what Broyard is talking about, uh, as if to confine the catastrophe. And by the way, she did follow up and the scarf was beautiful and my wife to this day still wears it. Uh, Brayard also says a sick person can make a story out of his illness as a way of trying to detoxify it. So it so it starts to take the toxicity away. And again, I want to say that that can be true for us as well. And then finally making narratives like this rescues me from the unknown, right? It begins to dissipate the sense of where the hell am I going? What the hell is happening to me? And I think that's true for us as well. So, and I think the best one that he says makes an allusion to the old days of trepanning and bloodletting for a seriously sick person, opening up your consciousness to others is like the bloodletting doctors used to recommend to reduce the pressure. Let's reflect on that for a second as physicians. I'm wondering if when Physicians read the story in Annals of Internal Medicine and emailed me and said, thanks. They were experiencing some of this reduce the pressure effect of just being in a story, opening up your consciousness to others to reduce the pressure, I think is why a number of those doctors said these are the conversations that we should be having with each other. On the receiving side, I, I, I often just am in awe of this honored invitation that we receive into the lived experience of another person, right? So receiving a story is such an invitation. It's such an invitation into that narrative. And it's a way for us to suspend our own narratives, right? And operate in the narratives of, of another, which I think importantly can chip away at the power differential in the relationship and moves us more toward the relationship side of that slide that I showed, as opposed to the, the sort of power defined differential on the left side. It activates our ability to imagine another person's lived experience because we never can ever fully understand the lived experience of another person, but we can come closer. And I think story receiving is an opportunity for us to do that, right? And not just imagining a way of being with a disease for a patient, but imagining how we can sort of clarify what we're now going to hope for? What can we hope for now in this new trajectory of the illness experience? And then I think really importantly, story receiving mitigates the aloneness. And it's so important to think about the patient. Once the patient tells her story, she's no longer alone in it. And once you receive the story, you're no longer alone in the work that you're doing. We're no longer alone. So I think this works for both of us. And then uh, finally, story sharing is what happens when we share these stories. I think, again, that we can never fully understand the lived experience of others. But the more of these stories we share, the better we get, the more broader we see, the more sets of lenses we look through in attempting to understand the experience of other. And here's something we don't do very well. It builds community. Again, it mitigates our aloneness. It puts us together in a story, right? It invites us to be together. The other thing I think is so important
important. And, and many of you who come from uh, the, the uh, mental health disciplines uh, are certainly aware that we aren't processing these feelings when we're suffering the work that we do, right? And sh sharing stories allows us to, pro I mean, that, in fact, writing this story, I wrote the story many years after it happened, which is evidence that I carried it with me. And even today, now many decades after it happened, I can't even read it aloud to you without tearing up. I still feel some of that shame and some of that guilt. I still feel grief over the loss of this patient, right? I still feel the inadequacy of my, you know, caring for her and how she died from complications of things we felt we needed to do. And, the, and sharing these stories, I think, allows us to process uh, some of those emotions. And then I want to uh, finally make mention of the fact that I think story sharing can be transformational. It can, uh, I often talk about the patients that I carry with me in the pockets of my white coat. It's a, it's a way that we take these stories and share these stories with each other and carry these stories as a way to transform us for subsequent care for subsequent patients. It makes us better at subsequent care and it makes us more open uh, to how we're going to operate uh, the next time. So I'll close by basically saying that most of, I think, what's been written uh, about the value of these story work approaches has been focused on the benefits that accrue to the patients. I think we underappreciate uh, that there are two people in the patient-physician relationship. And when patients and caregivers operate in stories, there can be enough healing to go around. So I'll stop there and uh, be happy to open up the conversation. I'll uh, get rid of the uh, share and uh, we can speak freely.